is Zach again, NewTutor.com. Coming in and making a video for you today. Um, so I got an email and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try maybe to respond to emails more and to comments more. And I'll try to do that if I can, because some of them are pretty good. And, and like I got another one, like I said before in the last video, that just got me all passionate. There's some things that are, I'm passionate about that I like to address. Um, certain things I know about. There's certain things I don't know about. There's certain things on this channel I won't touch with a 10-foot pole. Certain things I know very much about. Anyway, um, this last one kind of made my eyes bleed a little bit. Because there are people out there who have no freaking clue what it takes, what, what people in the Bible went through, how they lived. And, and this is one of the reasons why I tell people I homestead because I, I give that presentation, the, he, the agricultural roots of the Hebrew people. I give this presentation every so often when I go get called to speak in different places. And the reality is this, is that you, if you're a cab driver living in New York City, you are not going to comprehend and understand the lifestyle of a cattle rancher living in Texas because you're in two different worlds. Nor would that cattle rancher who lives in Texas understand the lifestyle and comprehend the lifestyle of the cab driver living in New York City. Two different worlds. So you as a modern 21st century American are not going to be able to at all comprehend what the people in the Bible lived through and went through, what their daily life was like, unless you separate yourself and sort of take on a little bit of this agricultural lifestyle that they went through. Being able to grow your own food, being able to raise animals, having livestock and land and being able to deal with that, all of the intricacies that that entails. You're never going to understand your Bible. And most 21st century Americans live in that world. They have no freaking clue. <laughs> Thus, we get to the email that we have today. Now, this was in response to uh, a video I did on the Ark Encounter about a huge error on the Ark Encounter. And um, I made the point in the Ark Encounter that they always put two and two together. When the Bible says nothing of the sort, the Bible says there was 14 clean animals that Noah put on the ark and only two unclean animals. And yes, many of you wrote in and said, oh, well, Zach, they have a small plaque on the wall that talk about that and acknowledge that, yeah, there was 14 animals, seven pairs, and, you know, and, and only two unclean. But they're still putting two and two on all of their exhibits. And so unless you go out and you see that small plaque that they have on the wall there, it's completely missed to you. And... And they're not getting the full point of this. If there's 14 clean animals and only two unclean animals, no one doesn't get off the ark after a year and eat one of the piggies because that would render the animal extinct. There's only a male and female of those. He's going to eat the clean animals. Thus, consistency being shown all throughout the Bible of we should eat the things that are clean, not the things that are unclean. But the Ark Encounter does not acknowledge that fact. So anyway, on that video I posted, you can eat giraffes. You can eat giraffes. Giraffes are a biblically clean animal. And thus writes Lisa. Hi, Zach. I love your post normally. This is going to go well. Just an FYI in case you didn't know. Even though according to Leviticus 11, giraffes are permitted, the giraffe was never eaten by covenanted Hebrews and did not consider it permitted to eat because they had no idea where the neck or how where on the neck or how to slaughter the giraffe without causing undue suffering. The giraffe's circulatory system and brain work very differently to other root, root, ruminants. Ruminants. You think yeah, she, she meant to say ruminants, I'm hoping. Uh, their I'm like, I don't know what a rudiment is. <laughs> their brain has a sponge effect and circulation has special valves. The valves allow oxygenated blood to remain in the upper skull that has not yet made its way to the brain and the sponge-like brain retains oxygenated blood so that even if you happen to cut the right arteries, the giraffe would still be conscious for several minutes after the heart stops beating. This is considered not permitted under the covenant as it causes undue suffering to the animal, as well as the blood trapped in the skull would be considered not having left the giraffe and would also invalidate the slaughter. No such thing is written in your Torah. As such, it is quite possible that Noah knew it was not permitted to eat giraffe because they didn't know how or knew they could not slaughter the animal in the Torah permitted way. Again, no verses to back that up. If this was truly the case, it's not, the giraffe would be the only root root rudiment, Lisa, it's ruminant, ruminant, that was not a permitted animal. Thus, Noah would have had to number it along with the unclean animals as it was not permitted to eat it as you cannot slaughter it in a permitted, permitted, ma permit, see, I, she's even got me going, <laughs> permitted manner. 
We forget that the permitted foods isn't just about two witnesses for being able to consume it, but how quickly, painlessly, and without extended suffering we can slaughter an animal. Just thought you may want to cons- just a thought you may want to consider. Okay, this is the reason why I tell I tell people that Disney has ruined so many of you. <laughs> this is the result of the, the Disneyfication of the world. All right, guys, there is no verse in your Bible that talk about or describe in any manner, in any manner, how to slaughter an animal. Not one single verse. I'll wait. Show me. Post it below. It does not give it. It doesn't give it. Guys, it doesn't matter how you kill an animal. You And so for those of you who don't know, there's this... There are people out there, I think, who teach this, you know, uh, to these. And again, these are just people who have no clue. Lisa, I can tell you one thing. You've never killed anything in your life. You have never killed anything in your life. And the, whoever told you this, has. if, if anyone told you this, because I know people, I get this from time to time. There are people out there teaching this. They've never killed anything in their life. This is why I tell people you need to go, you need to have a homestead. You need to, if you really want to understand the Bible, go raise some animals for food like they did it's not possible um there's this teaching going around out there that if you have a knife and if it's sharp enough you'll be able to walk up to this animal as he's calm and enjoying his day and just slightly run this knife across the neck and he won't even feel it and he'll just quietly go to sleep that is a bunch of nonsense but there are people out there who are teaching that garbage listen i've got a really nice uh, whatever Shinzenzu knife, whatever uh, some Japanese, you know, hundred dollar blade. It's 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 like a razor. It's like a lightsaber in my kitchen. I'll give that to you, big old knife. And you walk up to a thousand pound bull and you try to slice its throat. <laughs> you ain't getting a knife sharper than that thing. You are not gonna get a knife sharper than that thing. And you walk up to that bull and you try to slice its throat and have him not notice and have him not kick the crap out of you <laughs> for even thinking about doing what you're doing. <laughs> no, he's going to beat you to death. That bull will have its way with you and you will be dead. Oh, well, Zach, you don't understand. In the temple parade, they put him in these little cages so they could hold him. And then they did that. Well, well, then your point is moot because you can't. What's the point of having a knife that's so sharp it's just going to put him to sleep if you have to put him in a cage? Obviously, you're not putting him. He's not just falling asleep. He's going to know that you cut his throat. He's going to feel it the second you put that blade to his skin. You are living in a dream world. You've been living in a dream world, Neil. And which tells me you have no experience of that which you talk about. None. Zip. Zilt. Nada. Niet. <laughs> um, and, and by all means, I had, there's plenty of cows around here. If you want to try this, I can give you, you can take whatever blade you want. And you can come over to my place, you can come out here, and you can try to walk up to a thousand pound bull and just make it fall asleep. But we're going to sit back and watch the show. <laughs> Guys, um, this book um, in Leviticus, Leviticus, let's take a look at this verse. Leviticus 17, 13, And whatsoever man there be of the children of Israel or of the strangers that sojourn among you, which hunts and catches any beast or fowl that may be eaten, he shall even pour out the blood thereof and cover it with dust. Guys, we have chickens. Okay, every time we kill a chicken, you better believe it goes through suffering. It's suffering. For the, the, for the, for the minute or so, it's suffering. It has a great life here. It runs around, eats bugs. It's free to roam as it wishes. But one day, it, I think you just heard a chicken there. I was actually, I was my one of my boys. <laughs> but one day, the chicken show is over and he gets put upside down into a killing cone and off the neck. And that's it. And he suffers for a good minute. It's just, listen, when sin entered the world, death followed with it. It's that simple. It's that simple. Um, when you go out and you hunt an animal, just like it says you can in Leviticus 17, you you are going to shoot an arrow through that animal. I, it, you know, I've done this many times and the animal is going to take off when you hit that with that arrow. 
it's going to bolt because the adrenaline is going to be pumping through that animal and you're going to have to run up on that animal and, you know, wait till it bleeds out and then, you know, you can take that animal. But in the old days, they didn't have compound bows. They didn't have arrows that flew so hard out of that bow that it went past right through the animal. They didn't have expand, expanding broadheads that sliced every artery, artery as it went through. No, they had little pieces of flint and they had to probably shoot that animal two or three times. And then after every shot, run it down so that they could shoot it again. You talk about adrenaline. You talk about suffering. That's how they did it. And if you think otherwise, it's because you have no experience in doing it. We do. I know a thing or two because I've seen a thing or two. We are farmers. Bum, 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 bum. This is my hunting implement. It is a 308. 308, and it hits like Mark McGuire hits you with a baseball bat. And most of the time, my animals go right down where I hit them. Right down they go. But not always. But I guarantee you, for a few minutes, they're like, what in the world just knocked me, knocked my socks off? <laughs> they feel it. They absolutely, oop. There we go. Oh, there we go. <laughs> they absolutely feel it. They feel it. If Mark McGuire hits you with a baseball bat, pre or post steroid, it doesn't matter. You're going to feel it. So stop thinking this whole insanity that these animals have to su can't suffer. There's nowhere in your Bible, in your Torah, where that is a man-made rule. It says, do not add or take away from that I'm commanding you today. And a bunch of you people out there, because you watch too many freaking Disney movies, have added a whole bunch of Torah. Oh, well, the animal can't suffer. We can't allow it to suffer. Guys, I've told people before, when I take apart an animal, it's like, to me, taking off a box of crackers off the shelf and, shelf and opening it up. It's just food. I give it a good life here. It roams free. It, get, it grazes as it wishes. But one day, it's going to have a bad day. One day, it's going to suffer. I'm going to make it as quick as possible, but it's going to suffer. And it's going to bleed out. And whether or not I get all the blood out, there's nothing in Torah about any sort of slaughter protocols. I have a whole video on the blood and the fat. You can watch it. Okay, watch that video and understand some things. Understand that if you have not done it, you don't know about it. And there are people out there who try to teach others about what it means to slaughter an animal at the temple. They have no freaking clue. What they did at the temple, I'm telling you right now, here's what they did. They had a real heavy object. They hit that animal on top of the head and they brought it down, just like I do with my gun. I hit him in, I hit him in the neck and usually it will pop their neck or sometimes it just brings them right down because it's like getting hit with Mark McGuire's baseball bat. But they bring that animal down and then they come up and they slice the throat. How I do it is I pin my animal down. If I do it on Passover, I'm not going to shoot it in the head on Passover. And I, I pin that animal down. I catch that sheep. I put it, pin that animal down and I put a knife through their throat and rip it out. Oops. I put it in, rip it out. Blade extending outward and I rip it out. And that cuts its arteries and it bleeds out very, very quickly. But it does not have a good time during that process. Say, like, Zach, you're being pretty explicit. Well, you know, violates community standards, repeat offender. I'm just telling you the way things are. You want to kill an animal the quickest? You hold it down, put the blade in, facing outward, and rip it out. And that's going to be the quickest way to put that animal down and make it go to sleep. It'll have a bad day. But it's only got one bad day, hopefully. As it lives here, my animals are pretty happy. They have a good time. Most of them, a lot of them, will come up to you and let you pet them. <laughs> They're, they're going to eat us one day. I'm telling you, this is not a conspiracy. <laughs> uh, Lisa, I hope I'm, I don't want to, I don't want to make you upset. I don't, I don't feel like, I don't want you to feel like I'm coming down on you too hard. You've been sold a bill of goods. You've been sold a bunch of nonsense. You know, trust me, if the Hebrews were hungry, they were eating giraffes. Jerome T. And one day I hope to eat one. If I ever come across a giraffe in the greater Exodus, it's on the menu. <laughs> I'm going to lop that head off so fast you won't even know what hit it. <laughs> I can't wait to have a giraffe steak. There's no way that you're violating Torah by eating a giraffe. There's no mention anywhere in your Torah about spongy brains or 
blood circulating certain ways or no, any nonsense. It's all been made up by man. Do not add or take away. If you start adding crap like that, you're breaking Torah. You're sinning. Don't do it. Sin is always, always transgression of the law. And if you're adding stuff to it, then you're adding to the law. First John 3, 4. Always transgression of the law. Don't add or take away. All right. Um, again, this is something that I know about because we've done it. Um, it just is what it is. So, All right, guys. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you did like it, if you're not Lisa, because she's probably thumbing down the video. But if you're not Lisa, you can probably thumb up the video. No, I'm sure. I'm just kidding, Lisa. I'm just I'm just being funny. But I'm not trying to come down on you. It's just it's something I feel passionate about because it's something I do on a yearly, daily, monthly, weekly basis. We have animals. It's just part of the part of the joy of owning animals. It's just life. Um, but hit that like button before you go, and uh, I appreciate it. And um, for the rest of you, you know, go home, read your Bible. Thanks.